I am thankful to be with you. I have looked forward to uh, this opportunity since uh, I was invited to come again. And uh, I have been here a number of times. You would think after a while you'd get tired of hearing me. But uh, I appreciate uh, the invitation. And as I tell the congregation, or tell others about the congregation at Shelbyville Road, I've been there 38 years now. Uh, they are just gluttons for punishment. So that's what you are. You're just gluttons for punishment that have me back so often. But I'm, I'm honored to have been invited. I invite your attention to Hebrews 2. As you're turning there, keep in mind the book of Hebrews was written to encourage uh, Christians, Jewish Christians in particular, uh, from going back into Judaism. Some were on the brink and some had already gone back into Judaism. And the book of Hebrews is emphasizing that the uh, New Testament or Christianity is superior to the old law and to the old system. And so in Hebrews 2, beginning in verse 1, Paul said, or the writer tells us there, uh, Therefore we ought to give them more earnest heed to the things that we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For the words spoken by angels were steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness, both with signs and with wonders and divers miracles and gifts, of the Holy Ghost. And so here is sort of a, a parenthetical uh, thought here in Hebrews chapter uh, 2, verses 1 through 4, because the writer began in the introduction, verses 1 through 3 approximately, and verses 4 through actually the end of chapter 2, dealing with the superiority of Christ over the angels. But here he, he pauses in a parenthesis like, which doesn't mean it's not inspired, but simply to emphasize the importance of listening. And uh, aren't we thankful that we have ears, that we can hear? One of the rich physical blessings that we have is the ability to hear. You think about the ability to hear the birds singing in the spring of the year, or the crickets and the frogs in the summer, or to hear our loved ones say, I love you. There's nothing sweeter than for especially grandparents, to hear their grandchildren say, I love you. That's so sweet. Uh, and aren't you thankful that you can hear that? There are some people that have lost their hearing. They can't hear thunder, you know, but it's a wonderful thing that you and I can be able to hear. There's a young man at, uh, in Indianapolis. Uh, I've known him since he was real small. He's 18 years of age now, and he's had a hearing problem for all his life. And they've just put in some, uh, some kind of uh, gizmo, I call it, in his head. So now he can hear. And his, uh, his ability to speak is better. Uh, he doesn't have to yell. Uh, and so it's a blessing to be able to hear. And to, uh, to be able to imagine uh, what it would be like to have heard Jesus when he was here on earth. Think about that. Uh, how blessed those uh, apostles were and others were to be able to hear Jesus. But hearing is a necessity to go into heaven. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. God expects us to hear. In Luke chapter 8, and verse 18, in the parable of the sower, uh, Luke records there that Jesus said, Take heed how you hear. In Mark's account, in Mark chapter 4, and verse 24, Jesus said, in reference to that same parable, take heed what you hear. So we're to take heed, 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 or listen, to the content of what it said, but we're also to give attention to how we listen. And I just thought it would be interesting to give you a perspective of what I see and what other preachers see when they're preaching. Uh, what they see. Let me give you some thoughts about what I see in the audience. Not necessarily here, but sometimes when the preacher's preaching, you've got the jokers and the talkers. They're whispering to each other and talking. <laughs> Maybe even telling jokes to each other. So you've got the jokers and the talkers. 
And you've got, well, it used to be the note takers. People don't take notes now. They, now they've got texting. They can text, you know. Now they could be uh, making notes with their phones. I've done that before. Uh, when I didn't have pen and paper, uh, I've taken notes with my phone. Uh, they could be looking up scriptures with their phone. Or they could be playing games with their phone. I've seen young people uh, playing games during services. Uh, and others have seen that. And then, of course, you used to have note passers. Now people can just send a text to each other. Uh, you see that sometimes in an audience. Uh, and then you see those that are playing with babies. You know, uh, they do that during services. Uh, we're, we were all babies at one time. What's so unique about that? We were all babies at one time, and uh, that's not unusual. So we need to focus on what is taking place in the services, not just during the preaching. And then you've got the sleepers. Now, I, Paul had, had one that went to sleep on him. You know, in Acts the 20th chapter, Eutychus, young man, uh, fell asleep, fell out the third story window, and uh, uh, Paul had to go and raise him up from the dead. So you've got those that sleep. Now, I recognize that sometimes people had a rough night in Jericho, and they didn't sleep well that night. Maybe they were up all night with a baby. And so that's understandable. Or it might be they're on medication. Uh, and I'll have to confess that one year when we had a vacation Bible school that went through uh, Saturday afternoon, that Saturday afternoon I was sitting there as the preacher was preaching or teaching the class. And I don't know how long I dozed, but I dozed for a minute and he looked at me and I saw him and I realized I went to sleep. So as you get older, that sometimes happens. But uh, I'm not really that old. But uh, it might be you worked hard. My father-in-law was a hard worker. And when he was up, he was working. But when he sat down, he went to sleep. And I always thought it was a challenge to be able to try to keep him awake. Uh, but invariably, he'd sit on the front row, and I thought he went to sleep. Now, he may have just had his eyes closed. But it looked like he went to sleep on me. At least he didn't snore. So you got the sleepers. And then you've got uh, the walkers. You know, they get up and walk. Uh, they go this way, they get up during the services, get up during the invitation song, they get up and they're just walking. Here and there, maybe going to the restroom, maybe getting water, just walking. Well, that's distracting. That disturbs. There may be people in the audience that want to hear what's said, and when you get up and you start moving around, they're distracted. So you got the walkers. And um, we have a lady in our congregation that every service she gets up, with the one of her children at least once or twice during the services. Uh, the children are old enough to behave if the parents would make them behave. And then you got the lovers. I remember years ago at Shelbyville Road, there was a young couple sitting on the back row, and they were all intertwined with each other, and I said something publicly, you know. Sometimes I don't have enough sense not to say something, and I got into big trouble. But I don't, I don't regret having said what I did because that was not the time or the place to embrace, you know. Ecclesiastes says there's a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. Well, that's not the time to embrace. Um, so you got the lovers. And then you got uh, the nodders. What are the nodders? Well, those who are in agreement with you. They're nodding. And then you got the shakers. You ever seen someone shaking their head? I remember I was preaching in Michigan one time in a small congregation, and there was a lady there, and I was preaching on the church, and she was sitting back there going. <laughs> But I just kept on preaching, you know. So you got the nodders and the shakers. And then you've got the Joe, the sweet potato vine person. That, uh, let me give you an example. That's a person that just, he's just all over the pew. He's sitting here, you know, he's just, you know, he's all over the pew. You know, that's a Joe, the sweet potato vine person. Um, so you got that, that individual. And then you got the spectators. There's a, there's a brother in our congregation, he and his wife, they have no children. He loves children, but he's watching the children. I see him, he's got his eyes on the children. He's not watching me. Not that I have anything good to look at, but he ought to have his attention focused on the speaker, whoever it is, rather than watching the children. But that's what he does. And then you've got the late arrivers, 
and the early departers. You know, they've got to go earlier. They got to, they come late. You know, if you can be late on a regular basis, why can't you be on time regularly? You know, it, it, just get up a little earlier, you know. And then you've got, and this is what our audience has made up uh, this morning. You've got the listeners. Those who pay attention. Uh, their eyes are focused and their ears are in tune. But I want to speak to you for a few minutes about why we ought to give them more earnest heed. Number one, because it was spoken by Christ. Again, Hebrews 1, beginning in verse 1. God of his son are times in divers of man and spake in time past from the fathers by the prophets. Hath these last days spoken unto us by his son. We need to listen and give them earnest heed because it is Jesus that is speaking. He's speaking to us now through the Bible. He's not going to speak to us personally, but he speaks through the Bible to us. And so, if you were living during the time which Jesus was on earth, wouldn't you have wanted to have listened to him? Wouldn't you want wanted? Uh, would you not have wanted to have been like Mary, who sat at his feet, listening to Jesus, taking in what he said? What a blessed privilege it is to hear Christ, to hear his word. The message was first spoken by the prophets, Hebrews one, uh, one and Second Peter one twenty one. Prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So, uh, but God at sundry times in divers manner speaks now, of course, through His Son. And we're commanded to hear Christ. Remember when Jesus took with Him Peter, James, and John and went up into a high mountain apart? Matthew 17, 1 through 5. And uh, He was transfigured before them. And Peter was afraid. They, they'd been sleeping. <laughs> there they, they go again, sleeping. And... He, would, he awoke and he said, Lord, it is good for us to be here. But he was afraid. He didn't know what to say. Mark's account, I believe, says. And so he said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let's make three tabernacles. One for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And the voice from heaven, God, the Father, said, This is my beloved Son. Hear ye him. Not Moses, not Elijah, but hear Christ. Acts 3, 22 through 20 and 23 also tell us, that we will listen to Christ. For Moses truly said, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren and like unto me. Him shall you hear in all things, whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. So that's the reason we ought to hear Christ. And uh, we must hear Christ now because he's exalted above all. He's appointed the heir of all things that we talked about this morning in Bible class. He made the world. He's the brightness of the glory. He's the express image of, the per of his person, of the Father's person. He upholds th all things by the word of his power. He by himself purged our sins. That's the reason we ought to listen to him. We ought to give the more earnest heed to him. He's seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. That's the reason we should pay attention to him. And uh, a second reason for giving the more earnest heed to the things that we have heard is because it's possible for any one of us to drift from the teachings of Christ. We should not think, well, it'll never happen to me. It can happen to any of us. Paul himself said that he uh, buffeted his body and brought him to subjection lest when he had preached to others, he himself should be a castaway. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. It can happen to any of us. Some today are not anchored in Christ. Look over in your Bibles at Colossians chapter 1, uh, 23. Colossians 1, 23. The Apostle Paul speaks there in reference to being grounded in the truth. He says, If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. And then in Colossians 2, 6 and 7, Paul says, uh, For as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. So each of us 
as Christians must continue to grow and be grounded or anchored uh, in Christ. The subtle and powerful tides and currents surge and tug against the soul's safety. Uh, 1 Peter 5 and verse 8, Peter says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. And then because believers uh, failed to give diligence to make his calling and election sure. That 2 Peter chapter 1, 5 through 9 emphasizes the importance of adding the Christian graces to our lives. Beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity your love. Rent these things being in abound, and make you that you should neither be barren, nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so we're to add these Christian uh, graces to our lives. And then, I think one of the things that causes people to uh, fall away from the truth is a preoccupation with unimportant or secondary things to preempt too much of one's time and attention. In other words, majoring in minors. The most important thing for each of us to do is to go to heaven. And we should try to teach our children and our grandchildren that the most important thing in life is to go to heaven. You can be a success in any area of life. You can be a, a wealthy businessman. I was talking with um, Paul the other day about uh, uh, John D. Rockefeller. I read a book about him. Wealthy man. Had so much money, it's unbelievable to me how the, a man could have had that much money. But if you have all the money in the world and you miss heaven, you're a failure. What did the prophet a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Jesus said. One's drifting is something that's not overnight. You know, the, the prodigal son did not just wake up overnight and find himself in the pig pen. It was a gradual thing. One's failures today, one's choices today, may bring the results of tomorrow or ten years from now or in eternity. So it's important that we make the right decisions each day. And then the ever-present possibility and reality of falling from grace needs to be recognized. And I've emphasized that, that <coughs> any one of us can fall. Galatians 5, 4, Paul says of some of the Galatians, ye have fallen from grace. That is, if you go back to Judaism, he says you've fallen from grace. Number three, why should we give more earnest heed to the things we have heard? Number one, because it is Christ who has spoken. Number two, because we recognize that we can fall. Number three, every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense and reward in the Old Testament. You think about some of the punishment that came upon Israel of old. The law of Moses was given for several reasons. One of which is mentioned in Galatians 3.19. Galatians 3.19 emphasizes the idea that because of transgressions, the law was given. Uh, and so there was a need for the law. It was also a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, in particular the Jews. The law was given to Israel but was not kept by them. In Deuteronomy 5 verses 1 through 3, Moses said there, The Lord our God made a cup with us at Horeb. He made not this cup with our fathers, but with us, even all of us who are alive here this day. Who was that? It was Israel. They were at Mount Sinai. Moses was referring back to that occasion. And then, those who died, who despised Moses' law, died without mercy under, under two or three witnesses. Some examples. These are familiar to you. Remember the story of Nadab and Abihu. Remember God had told them to take the fire from a certain location, a certain source, to light the fire for the incense. And they chose to get the fire from another source. Now when you read Leviticus 10, uh, it's my judgment, this is just purely my judgment on it, that it may have been the case that they were drunk. 
because you, lay, you read on after the, uh, the account of their being struck dead by fire from heaven, God sent down fire from heaven, it tells them not to drink. Uh, tells individuals not to drink when they're serving. So it may be the case, I don't know, but Leviticus 10, 1 and 2 tells us that Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them incense and put fire therein and incense thereon and offered up strange fire before God, which he commanded not. Now, whether they were drunk or not, it doesn't make any difference insofar as what happened then because they disobeyed God. They did not take the fire from the right source. And what about the man picking up sticks on the Sabbath in Numbers 15 32? That seems like a, a harsh thing, doesn't it? But God had said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And in fact, every one of the Ten Commandments involved a death penalty if it was violated. At, uh, at the mouth of two or three witnesses. But here was a man that, in essence, was saying, I don't care what the law says. I don't care what God says. I'm going to do what I want to do. And he died. He was put to death because he was picking up sticks on the Sabbath day. The principle is, one might think that's a small thing, but he disobeyed God. If a father or a mother tells a son, a child, come to me, and the child doesn't come, that may seem a small thing. But it's a big thing because in essence the child has been in rebellion to the, to the parents. So here was a man that was in rebellion to God. And then what about the man who cursed and blasphemed God? You know, we live in a world which people have no respect for the name of God and for God. People say, oh my God. People take the Lord's name in vain. People use the expression OMG, which means, oh my God. They're not talking to God in a reverent way. They're taking his name in vain. What happened to people like that? Well, here's a man in Leviticus 24, 10 through 16. He got into an argument with a, another man, and because of that, he was put to death. He was to be stoned, and he was. You think, well, that's a, that's a terrible punishment. But listen, every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. We need to respect the name of God and things that are holy. And then what about Achan in Joshua, the seventh chapter? Jericho was to be taken, and they were not to take anything. It all was to be devoted to God. The gold, the silver, and everything. Well, Achan, when Jericho was uh, taken, he saw a battle on his garment. He saw gold and silver, and he took it. And of course, because of that, in the next battle at Ai, 36 men died. 36 men died because Achan was covetous. And of course, he was then put to death along with his family, who evidently had a part in that. And then Uzzah, in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, the Ark of the Covenant was being moved. It was put on a new ox cart. And as they were traveling along, the, ox, the oxen stumbled. And Uzzah just simply held his hand up to steady the Ark of the Covenant so it wouldn't fall. God struck him dead. Why? Because it was only the Kohathites that were to move the furniture. And they were not to touch it. They were to even carry it on uh, rods. Uh, and they were not to touch it. And so Uzzah was struck dead. Moses was not allowed to go into the promised land because he spoke inadvisedly. He said, must we fetch you water? When they had cried out for water, God had told him, you speak to the rock. Instead, he, he, he struck it. And because of that, he was not allowed to go into the promised land. Now later we read about his uh, being on Mount Sinai, being on uh, the Mount of Transfiguration, but the consequences of his sin and Aaron's sin on that occasion was they were not allowed to go into the promised land. Every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. Hebrews 10, 25 says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, so much the more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. But uh, how much sore punishment, Paul says, uh, suppose ye shall he be worthy of trodden the foot the Son of God and have done despite the Spirit of grace and so forth. In other words, they were punished for what they did. 
But how much greater the punishment will be for us who live under a superior system, the gospel, if we turn away from uh, the truth. You know, there are two types of sin. There, is, there are sins of ignorance, carelessness, and weakness. And all of us, from time to time, are guilty of those things. Leviticus chapter 4 emphasizes that. But there are also sins of presumption, high-handed rebellion. Psalm 19, 13, David said, Keep back thy servant from presumptuous sin. That's the sin of, in which one says, I don't care what God says, I'm going to do what I want to do. And then the fourth reason why we ought to give an honest heed is because of so great salvation. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 3. Why is salvation great? Briefly, number one, it's spoken by the Lord. Hebrews 2 and verse 3. Confirmed by miracles. Hebrews 2 and verse 4. When compared to other salvations, think about the salvation of Noah and his family. That was physical salvation. Noah and his family, the eight souls were saved by water. All the rest died. What a wonderful thing that was that his family was spared because they were obedient to God. But everyone else died. But how much greater would be the salvation of our family uh, eternally if we are obedient to the Lord? And then what about, what about Israel? Being delivered from Egyptian bondage. Great, a great salvation, but a greater one is our salvation or our uh, being saved from the bondage of sin. And then salvation is great because of its promises. And there are many promises. The forgiveness of sins, uh, Acts 2.38. Unresolved guilt is one of the most powerful things in the world. People have a difficult time living because of unresolved guilt. And that's because they have not been forgiven of their sins. And then the wonderful blessing of the promise of the hope of eternal life. 1 Peter 1 verse 4, to an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, that fate is not away, reserved in heaven for you. John 14, 1 through 3, a passage that's familiar <coughs> to you as well. Salvation is great because of the one who saves us. Acts 4, 12, neither is there salvation in the other. For there is none under the name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Salvation is great because of the awful condition in which man is found. Man is lost. Without hope, without God in the world, Ephesians 2 and verse 12. But because of Christ, because of this salvation, we can be saved when we have hope and we can be brought nigh unto the Father. Salvation is great because it's universal. It's for all men. Jesus didn't die for a select number of people. He died for all men. And all men have the privilege of being children of God if they will obey the gospel. Hebrews chapter 5 tells us uh, in reference to salvation, that though he were son, yet learned the obedience by the things that he suffered, and being made perfect, they became the uh, author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. Verses 8 and 9. And salvation is great because of its cost. Think of the cost that Jesus paid for your salvation and mine. He gave his precious blood, 1 Peter 1 and verse 18. For as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received from the tradition from your fathers but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. So why should we give them more earnest heed? Number one, because of the one who spoke, Jesus. Number two, because it's possible for any one of us to fall away. Number three, because every transgression and disobedience received a just recommends a reward. And number four, because of so great salvation. Now, if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, what must you do to be saved? I was telling Paul and Kim last night that Lois and I were sitting on the, on the couch. We'd just finished uh, Skyping with uh, one of our uh, sons and his children, and uh, we, we'd gotten off the, the Internet and the, her phone rang. And so Lois answered it, had it on the speaker, and a young man came on the uh, speaker and he said, are you saved? And Lois said, yes, I, I'm saved. He said, did you accept Jesus in your heart? And uh, 
I asked him, I spoke up, and I said, well, where do you read of that in the Bible? Where do you read of accepting Jesus Christ in your heart and you'll be saved? I said, I'm interested in finding that verse. <clears throat> well, he paused for a minute and he thought, well, he said Mark 16, 16. I said, well, that's a good verse to go to. Let's look at it. Will you read it for me? So he read it. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. I said, believe plus baptism is equal to salvation. Notice that little word and, that ties the two together. That makes them equal grammatically. So if belief is necessary for salvation, baptism is necessary for salvation. And I began to continue to talk, and Lois made some comments as well. Uh, she took him to Acts 8, and we talked about that a little bit. And then he, he stopped and he said, well, I, evidently I called the wrong home. Well, really he called the right home because uh, it gave us an opportunity to talk to him. But if you're here and you believe the gospel and you're willing to repent of your sins, to confess the sweet name of Jesus and to be buried with the Lord in baptism, raised to walk in the newness of life, the Lord will add you to his church. You'll be saved. And you can enjoy walking in Christ and enjoying the blessings of Christ. You're a child of God, but wayward. What must you do? Peter told Simon to repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps a thought in heart may be forgiven me. And so if you're outside of Christ, or you're wayward, we invite you to come all together and stand and sing.